Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good morning. My name is Sheila. I'm an alcoholic. And, uh, yay, Norman, Oklahoma. I'm from Norman, Oklahoma, the Phoenix group. If you're ever there, please look us up. We have a real fun group. I think the best group in the Midwest. But if you, and I heard long, Clint, Clint H always says, if you don't think that your home group's the best group, get a job in your home group. And I always have liked that. Um, I want to thank the committee and Ray, um, for having me here and, uh, all the, you know, the work that they put into this conference. Um, I know that conferences are hard to put together, and uh, and you all have done a great job. My flower is so beautiful. I love my flower, and and uh, the greeters. What? Geez, greeters now. I mean, you guys got greeters here. You know, the the thing is, I was always a greeter. My sponsor always made me be a greeter when I was new, and now I'm like head greeter at our group. I love that. You get promoted to head greeter, and. Um, and I really, I really do. Um, greeters, I mean, it was like I was always so welcomed in Alcoholics Anonymous. I remember when I first got there, people would say, I'm glad to meet you. And, and I think that's so important. Um, uh, I was taught early on, you know, look for the people standing in the corners of the room, you know, and get out of yourself and go do something for someone else. And so I really appreciate greeters and, and people that um, have been very nice to me this weekend. And, uh, and my, um, my hostess, Marilyn, has just been... She's just been wonderful. I mean, you know, I've had hostesses that forgot to pick me up before, and uh, which is okay, I guess, if you like to do that. But, um, <laughs> but um, she has just been just above and beyond the call of duty, truly. And uh, and uh, I'm so excited to see. Uh, I've seen old friends, um, you know, since I've gotten here, and I've got to meet new friends. And uh, and I always feel like I kind of cheat when I get asked to do something like this because I get all the benefits. I mean, I just have such a great time and get to hear people. I got, John just was wonderful and and um, and Chuck and I just um, was so um, I really was really moved by um, the talks um, that I've heard and uh, I got to listen to the fourth, fifth, and sixth step workshop. I thought that was real, real, real good for me and. Um, so I really am grateful to be here, and um, this is an absolute honor and a privilege. Um, anything I get to do in Alcoholics Anonymous is a get to do today. You know, I don't have to do. Uh, I mean, I feel like I have to do it, but it's uh, I get to do things because I'm sober. And um, I was um, I was born in Oklahoma to two normal alcoholics, did normal alcoholic things. You know, uh, they got divorced before I remembered they were married, and. Uh, and I have a brother who's 13 months younger than I am, and and uh, my dad moved away to California, and I didn't really meet him till I was seven years old later on. And um, my mom took care of us. I thought my mom was the most beautiful woman in the world. Um, I loved her very much. She um, she was exciting, and she was fun, and she was um, a nurse, and she would pick us up from school. And she'd have, that was the days where they wore all white and the caps. And then on a cold day, she'd wear a blue, um, a blue cape. And, and I thought she was just like an angel, you know. I thought she was just the neatest. I remember feeling so proud of her to come pick me up at school. And, and so, um, one of the things, um, my mother uh, suffered from the disease of alcoholism, so she was gone a lot, you know. And uh, she would, uh, she was a blackout drunk. I'm second generation barfly. And, um, <laughs> And uh, she uh, she loved to drink and dance and run and go and um, she she liked men and she had boyfriends and she'd just be gone for like you know periods of time and Sundays we'd go to grandma's you know for Sunday dinner and uh, we then she'd make us take a nap and I always hated to go take a nap because I knew she'd be gone when I woke up and sometimes she'd be gone for two days and sometimes it was two weeks and eventually it got to be two months and. One of the times that she was gone, we just started kind of living at my grandmother's house. And one of the times she was just missing, and they had a missing persons uh, uh, bulletin out for her. No one knew where she was for months and months. And uh, I don't ever remember being really mad at her for that. I just wanted her to come home. I just always wanted her to come back. And um, I, uh, uh, the social workers came one day and told my grandmother that she couldn't, you know, she wasn't well enough to take care of us. So we went to live in a foster home. And uh, and uh, my mother, I saw her. On um, 
on Easter Sunday, and we had been there about three or four months or six months or so, and, and, um, she, and we went to see my grandmother, and it was just the best day, and I remember we had to go back, and, and I didn't understand why, you know, and today I understand why, but I was not to see my mother again till, um, and I was seven at this time, I wasn't to see her again until I was 19 years old, you know, and that's the disease of alcoholism, as I know it today. And um, I, my father came, he was married to a nice Mexican lady in California, and he, his brother called him and said, your kids are in a foster home, and he came to take care of us, and, and he got custody of us because my mother just never showed up for court, you know, and I understand why today. And um, that was the very, very best she could do. And, you know, and I know that today, not just in my head, but I know it in my heart because of Alcoholics Anonymous, because of the wonderful steps here, because of the healings that go on in the rooms and um, with people that would share things with me, that it took the time, took much time with me to work steps and stuff. And I'll always, always, I have a debt to Alcoholics Anonymous I feel I will never, ever be able to repay. Um, we went to live with um, my father, and unfortunately, he had the disease of alcoholism, and and he was a, a crazy drunk, and and I liked, I love drunks, you know, I just do, and um, I still love drunks, and so, and he was he was exciting, and but he was always he was really kind of he was very volatile, and he and I just didn't get along, and it wasn't really it was just because he wasn't my mom, you know, that was the whole thing. I never really gave him much of a chance, and. Uh, and uh, we uh, got off the airplane, and, and we went on a freeway, and we went fast, and I love to go fast. I still like going fast, except in the air. And um, uh, and, uh, and 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 he was um, he was uh, he you know this lady that he was married to was a wonderful lady and had a wonderful family, and and you know she didn't have Alan on, and uh, I was not to see her again until I was 18 years old, and we went to live with my aunt and uncle in Arizona, and they took care of us as long as they could, and. And something happened that would change my life forever when I lived in Arizona. My father um, got sober in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, um, yeah. And so um, he and his sponsor talked, and his sponsor, uh, they painstakingly had to, he said, I, I don't know what to do. I can't take care of him. He was living in a 12-step house. And that wasn't, back then it was, you know, it was like some beds with, with terribly drunk, hor horribly sick alcoholic men and he lived there and he would uh, ride on a plumbing truck for like 50 cents an hour or something, you know, and, uh, and he didn't have any way to take care of us. My mother couldn't take care of us and my aunt and uncle were doing the best they could but they had a family and they, so we uh, came to California and uh, they decided that we should go into a foster home again and, and I remember my dad dropping me off and, um, and I, I just wondered, you know, and, and I've heard him talk before, and he watched me, and he thought, he knew what I was thinking, you know, you're leaving me again, and, um, you know, and I learned through Alcoholics Anonymous the pain that he went through to put us in that foster home, and for years, I just think no one, I thought no one ever cared, you know, and that wasn't it, it was, it was what he had to do, it was the best he could do, and, and so my, uh, my dad, uh, continued to go to meetings with Alcoholics Anonymous, and we lived in this foster home, and, um, and it was a good foster home. It was a black foster home. And we were supposed to stay there for about two weeks until I guess they could find us a white foster home. And, uh, <laughs> and because this was the 60s, you know, the late 60s. And, uh, um, what happened was, um, they never did. And, uh, when they discovered that they hadn't found us or placed us somewhere else, we loved where we lived and we didn't want to go. And, and this lady named Betty and Leo, her husband Leo, and they had a child, um, their own, their son Walter. And, and they, she was good to us and she loved us. And, uh, and I told my dad if we had to be in a foster home that, you know, this was the very best one. And, you know, he had strong sponsorship. His sponsor, um, from the time he ever had a sponsor until of his death recently was Clancy. And Clancy, um, will always be special in my life because he cared and he gave great direction. My dad came to visit us every week in that foster home. And there were a lot of kids that came to that home that no one ever came to visit. And they would look forward to my dad coming to visit because he'd always give us a quarter for allowance, you know. And so then he gave everybody a quarter for allowance and uh, probably had to get a second job, you know. And uh, <laughs> and uh, he, um, he really... Um, 
I would be so proud. I would never tell him this, of course, because I was such an angry child. But I would feel so proud that he would show up. And uh, and he, I knew he was going to Alcoholics Anonymous. And I remember um, I was we were driving, and we got to spend a, like a whole weekend with him one time. And we had been there about a year. And uh, he had this lighter. He smoked then. And uh, he had this lighter. And uh, it said Architect in Adversity on it. And I, I was learning to, you know, I was trying to sound out adversity. And uh I said, Dad, what does that mean? And he said, uh, he said that that means you've gone to hell and back, you know. And uh, that was his one year lighter from his sponsor, you know. And uh, and those are the things that I remember. And uh, he met a nice lady in AA, and she had two kids, and he had two kids, and we got together. But it was not the Brady Bunch, I'll tell you that. It was crazy. <laughs> I had two sick, wounded families trying to pull them together, and um, they were newly sober. I mean, they were like three and they're like three years sober, both of them, and, and he was trying to do that. We lived there three and a half years in that foster home. I'm still in contact with my foster mother today, and, and she's, she and I have a wonderful relationship, and, uh, and I love her dearly. My foster father is dying of cancer right now, and he's very sick. And um, we, uh, uh, My dad went to lots of meetings. There was lots of alcoholics around the house. You know, I remember when Clint H. was a newcomer. You know, I remember when a lot of these old-timers were newcomers. Ha, ha, ha. And uh, <laughs> I got to watch you all grow up. And, uh, you know, and it was, it, was, it, was a nice, it was a neat time in our life back then. And uh, things were a little crazy in the house, but they kept going to Alcoholics Anonymous meetings. And unfortunately, that marriage didn't last. So we went to live with her sister, the woman that he had married. And, and um, because... And that's what they had decided to do, and and we went. And my aunt lived down the street from my dad, you know. So I went to go live down the street. And I remember I'd come home from a cheerleading practice or something, and and I'd wave at my dad watering the lawn, and they go, "Is that, who's that?" And I go, "That's my dad." And they go, "Your dad lives down the street from you?" And I go, "Yeah, didn't yours?" You know, I mean, you know, the big book talks about the abnormal becoming normal, you know. And it just, I told me, hey, it works a lot better when they live down the road, and uh, you know, and because <laughs> we just did not get along. My father and I, we butted heads, and. Uh, and my brother, he just kind of always got quiet. He just kind of went inside himself. And uh, and he and unfortunately, he's probably still there. You know, he uh, suffers, I believe, from he he walks like a duck and talks like a duck and quacks like a duck. And I think he's a duck, but we're not supposed to say that. So he's just a duck. <laughs> and um, and the, the neat thing is, is that um, uh, I went to school and my aunt had four children. She was a single mother with four children, and she wanted and she took two more in. You know, I mean, God had put so many wonderful people in my life. And I, through inventory and through um, looking at um, life differently, like a new pair of glasses is what um, I've heard so many times. You know, I used to feel so very sorry for myself in my life and feel so badly that I, had, I didn't have people that loved me. And yet I had so many people that loved me. I mean, this woman took us in and she, are, she was a single mother with, two, with uh, four children. And, and she loved being a mom. She loved taking care of us and she worked. And her mother lived there too. And it was like we had five teenagers in the house at one time. That's insanity. I don't. I have one right now. I don't know what the heck I'm going to do with him. But, um, and so I went to school and I became a cheerleader. And I my my life got kind of normal then. Is and and the only problem was me. You know, my head, me and my head. And I got asked to the prom, and uh, it was funny because. Everybody, all the girls in the family had been asked the prom, and I hadn't been asked yet. And they were like, "Oh, I hope she gets asked, you know, because then she, you know, she looked like a, the ugly duckling." And so this guy said, "Well, you don't have a date, and I don't have a date. You want to go to the prom?" And I said, "Sure." You know how romantic. And so we went to the prom, <laughs> you know. And uh, my aunt wanted me to buy this. To, to, should we go get the dress? And she wants it to be really, really special. And so I said, um, "Okay." And I picked out this real long slinky kind of yellow dress low cut you know of course and and she comes out with this dress that is just the biggest dress I've ever seen it was huge and um it had green giant green flowers with chiffon over the top of it and it had like one of those accordion collars that goes way up to here you know I look like Debbie Reynolds going to a party you know la 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 Debbie Reynolds and the doctor or something and so and I felt just I just hated that dress but I was kind of a I was a real isolator kid and my I heard early on Sheila why don't you be a part of why don't you become a part of because I would just go off and be alone I would go smoke cigarettes and watch airplanes take off at LAX you know that was my idea of a great day and uh, you know because no one would bother me and I didn't have to deal with anything and I didn't have to feel anything and and so 
I knew I know when to get the heat off. You know, the heat was kind of on because I really wasn't being a part of this family, and so I know how to get the heat off. So I, I go, okay, I'll get that dress. And then she asked me if I would go to her hairdresser, you know, and nobody went to their aunt's hairdresser or anybody's hairdresser back then. You know, you wore your hair long and straight, kind of like now, and a little curled at the ends. And so I said, okay, um, I, uh, I'll go to your hairdresser. I thought, well, how much harm can we do? Ha ha. And. Um, <laughs> And uh, the lady goes, what would you like? And I said, well, a little bit up, a little bit down, you know, not, you know, not anything. To, and I stayed under the dryer for like days, it seemed like. I was under there forever. The top of my ears are still red from that experience. <laughs> it was horrible. And uh, and so uh, I look in the mirror, and my hair keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And, it gets, and then it starts going this way, like a football. And my hair is this big. And my aunt comes in and goes, oh, you look so beautiful, honey. And then she had this baby's breath, yellow and white. And, and so they're sticking this baby's breath all in my hair. So I look like a bush in bloom at this point, And I'm really upset, you know. And so me and my hair go out to the car. And I, and, and I got to go get the giant green dress on. And I'm ready to die. And I'm 15 years old and I'm an angry kid. And I've got all these emotions that I'm ready to explode. And, and my foster mother came to take the pictures of me going to the prom. My dad came from down the street, you know. And, and, the, and the guy that I went to the prom with three days before the prom, he bit the head off a live frog. Isn't that great? Um, you got a visual? It's really great. And for a hundred dollars, I have to always put that in. You know, it was. A, I said I had given you the hundred dollars, you goof. <laughs> and all the kids at school run up. Oh, the guy you're going to the problem with just spit the head off a live frog. And I said, you know, can anything ever go right just once? You know, <laughs> I was just so. Dep- I was so. I was just sick. You know, what am I going to do? I've got. You know, so he comes in and and everybody like borrowed their parents' cool car. You know, not him. He had this car that you would push a button and it would start. It was a Dodge or something, and and he said, "Isn't that he loved this car?" And it was beautiful. And he, I thought, "Oh God, you know." And so everybody's around, and my cousin comes running out. My dad's standing there, and and he says, "My cousin says, are you the guy that bit the head off a live frog?" And my dad goes, "Oh my God, you know." And he's a big man, and and he rolls his eyes up in his head. And one more time, I don't feel like I'm enough. I just don't feel like I'm enough. And you know, and I, my dad and I had this crazy relationship before I got sober. I, it was like, "Love me, love me, love me," but I. I did everything I could to push him away. I pushed every button I could to get him mad, to say, see how he acts, see how he is. And I did that for many years. That's a pattern of mine that I did for many years before the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. We whisk off to the prom, and he has these little cheap champagne glasses and says, would you like some champagne? And I said, yes. And I thought, how much can this hurt me? This isn't going to hurt me. This is no big deal. Because, of course, you know, I knew what alcoholism had done to my life, with my life. And so we... uh, we went to, um, we had a couple of sips and went to the prom. No big deal. Everything was fine. And, and, and we went to the after parties. Oh, well, the after parties are where it goes. And it was, and, and people were mixing drinks in my little champagne glass. And, and I kept thinking, this isn't going to hurt me. I had 150 of those puppies. And I want to tell you what, my hair got long and straight. Those flowers flew off that dress and frog lips started looking really good. <laughs> you know? And that is what alcoholism, that is what it is for me. That's what alcohol did for me. It's like nothing had changed, but everything changed, you know. He was, oh, he was gory. He was a prince, you know. And, um, and, and I was okay. I remember feeling that sense of I was okay, the ease and comfort. And I didn't care anymore in that that knot in my stomach was gone, and it was the most wonderful feeling I had ever had. And I passed out, I blacked out, I threw up. I did all the fun things that we do the first time I ever drank. And I thought, I, but all I could remember was the wonderful feeling and the sensation that it came over me when I picked up that stuff. And I didn't just go into full-blown alcoholism. I just partied. I partied through high school. I got out of high school. I started, I was a waitress. I loved waitressing. I was in control. I was fast. I made great money. You know, I could make, and you could sleep all day and work all night. It was wonderful. I worked at Bob's Big Boy. In fact, I was on, I I came to Northern California one time because um, I opened, we were on a task force team, and we opened the first Bob's Big Boy in Concord. And so that's my only claim to fame. And so, 
and, and we, it was like, and I would, I loved it. I loved it, what we did, but we party and we drink and, and I had to go in at six in the morning one, at one shift and, uh, to trade with this girl and she needed the day off. So I worked the 6 a.m. shift, which I normally didn't do. And I just got, was drunk the night before real bad and had about three hours sleep. And, and I came in and, and my eyes were just, you know, that, oh, they burn and they hurt. And you just, every time you take a drink of water, you get drunk all over again, you know, and, and so we went to, um, this girl, she said, what's wrong with you? And I said, oh, I'm just hung over. She goes, here, take one of these. You'll be zipping around in no time. Honey, I zipped around for three days. <laughs> Lord, have mercy. It was a prelude, and I don't know if anybody knows what that is. I just went crazy. I made a lot of money, though. And uh, <laughs> I, the, waitress, the waitress that cannot stop waitressing, it was crazy. And... <laughs> And so I did that, and it, and it seemed like I started to get in some trouble. I kind of woke up in a field and uh, didn't know where I was and uh, and don't remember how I got to the field. And, uh, you know, little things like that, nothing serious. And um, and what happened is that that kind of stuff started happening. And then the hymns, I had boyfriends, and that relationships never seemed to work out. And uh, and so I was uh, I was waitressing, and I was selling advertising, and I, I uh, went to this bar, and uh, this guy um, bought advertising from me, and uh, and uh, then we started dating, and uh, he owned a bar. It was like free free beer and pool the rest of my life. I do. We got married, and uh, and uh, he, he looked like Paul Bunyan, you know. He really did. He's real tall, and he looked like Paul Bunyan. I mean, have you ever seen him? <laughs> and, uh, and he was uh, he loved to party, and he was fun, and he was Irish, and he was and my grandmother used to say Irishmen make great fathers and terrible husbands, you know. And well, I guess she was right, and so. We uh, had this insane relationship, and uh, my mother at this time, uh, I, I went to Alcoholics Anonymous right before I met this man, I, I don't want to forget this, and because of this field incident that I woke up in this field, and I thought, and I went to my dad's 10th AA birthday, and uh, he was 10 years sober, and I went to his birthday, and uh, and we were there, and uh, I heard something that night at his birthday party, and, and, I, and I called this gal, and her name was Sharon B., and uh, I understand she was a speaker here, and I called her, and she was a newcomer, and she was, uh, and she was so nice, and she took me kind of under wing, and I stayed sober in the Pacific Group for nine months, and, uh, and I just didn't think I was an alcoholic. You know, I just wasn't willing to go to any lengths. I did everything I was supposed to do, but I wasn't taking right action. Did a lot of activity, but I wasn't taking right action. There's a big difference for me today in that, and and I didn't stay sober. And um, I met this man, and we got married, and and uh, we got to, we got crazy. And my mother and I had seen my mother when I was 19, and that was a disaster. I mean, she wasn't the pretty woman I remembered anymore. And I got a call, and I was 23 years old, and I got a call that my mother was dying in Texas. And, she had moved to Texas, and I flew to Texas, and I didn't know what I would see. And, and I don't know if you've ever seen anyone dying of cirrhosis of the liver, and it's just it's a pretty awful sight. And, and I, when the nurse was trying to tell me, you know, explain to me what was going on, and I said, look, I, you know, I've been through so much, this is no big deal. And that's how I was, you know, I just toughen up and, and suck it up and go do it. And, and I walked in that room, and, the, you know, she had tubes running in and out of her, and she was yellow and swollen. And, and I just, and I felt so sad, and she was in a coma, and I thought, you know, she doesn't even know I'm here. And... And what, and I just felt so awful about my life. I absolutely hated my life. And, and I didn't like God much either. Cause I thought, you know, what kind of God would have someone have a life like this? And I loved my mother. I thought she was such a wonderful lady. And, and if God really loved her, why didn't he take care of her? You know, and today I know my mother was given the gift of Alcoholics Anonymous. She just never stuck around. You know, she had had 30 days at one time and 60 days at one time, but she just didn't, she was given the gift. And what do we do with the gift? You know, what she did was she gave it back. She said, I'm not really, really like you people. And I remember her telling me that. And uh, so I sat there and I read to her and I, and I spent the evening with her and I slept there. And, and I just remembered that the last thing to go is the hearing when they're in a coma. And, uh, and then her, her sisters came, my aunts, who I hadn't seen since I was a young girl. And they were telling me stories about Jimmy and I when we were little, my brother. And, and I just felt so angry, you know, and I thought, where were you all? How come you didn't come and get us? How come I don't even know you people? And it was just a, that that turmoil, that craziness that goes on. And why didn't anybody ever love me? And I was on and on and on. And and um, they asked. They said the nurse said uh, the doctor said they had asked us to leave until they were examining her, and she was still in the coma. And, uh, and we were sitting outside, and the <clears throat> nurse came out and said, "You need to come in here right now." And I thought, well, this must be it. And, and we went in there. And my mother was sitting up, and she said, "Will you forgive me?" And I said, yes. I said, yes. Because I, I loved her. 
And because of this program, you all have taught me real forgiveness. You know, steps eight and nine are just really powerful. And I really, really thank God that they're there. And uh, I um, I went to a conference, and I was a year sober, a little over a year sober. And it was a woman's conference. And, and they, I was goofing around. You know, I wasn't dealing with any issues or anything. I was just goofing around at the conference. And this one lady named Sue D. was, um, she was... Uh, leading the workshop and I went in and the workshop was on forgiveness and I was kind of sitting in the back and my stepmother Benoit was there and her daughter and and they start talking about mothers and forgiveness and that's it just kind of went around and uh, people said you know i my mother and I we've made our amends and and I uh, you know I love her and she loves me and we have a great relationship and then Tracy my stepsister stood up and said you know my mom gave me this program through her you know pass this on and she always tried to give me this this solution I never wanted it but today I do and I'm so glad I'm here and you know and I'm getting this knot in my throat and I think you know I've done a fourth and a fifth step I've done all this stuff why can't this go away and I remember saying a prayer God will you please take this and um I got up from that workshop. It was one of those things, meetings where you can't wait till it's over, you know, and say the Lord's Prayer and then you go. And I thought, I just need to get some air. I'm just going to get outside and get some air. And, and I was going outside and I was trying to just stuff that stuff back down. And, and somebody was coming up behind me and I kind of moved over and she moved over and, and I turned around and she just grabbed me. And she just kind of held me and kind of rocked me. And, and I remember I cried and cried and cried. And I, it was like somebody had let go of a, a giant, River and um, she said, Sheila, your mother loved you, and she'd be proud of you because I love you and I'm proud of you. And that was my stepmom that did that. And I'll always be so grateful because what she did was she happened to turn around and she said, I just saw the pain on your face and I knew I knew instantly what was going on. And um, I my experience in Alcoholics Anonymous is that you all have filled in the gaps of my life so beautifully. There have been people in this program that have help me get the healing that I never knew was possible. And uh, if you just stick around and work these steps, do the deal, I promise you, you'll have your healing as well. Because there's someone here that's going to fill in that gap. That is, they have filled it for so many, so many times for me. And uh, I went, um, my mother, I spent three days with her in that hospital, and we had three really great days together. And uh, and I believe that was God. I believe that was God's gift. I really, truly do. And uh, I had to go back to California. I didn't know how. And the doctor said he didn't know how long she would be sick. And so I said that um, I would come back to see her in a couple of weeks. And uh, she died that that week. And uh, she died on Good Friday. And I called my dad. And I hadn't talked to my dad in a while. And I said, Dad, um, would you come help me? Because I don't want to do this by myself. Would you help me? And he said, yes. And my brother came to the funeral. My dad flew back to Oklahoma. It's where we buried her. And my dad would, and it was a tough thing for him to do, but he went ahead and did it, you know. He hadn't seen this lady in years. And my brother was there. My brother, my dad, and, and I were all standing around. And, and, I th- and that was the first time I ever remember us all together. And, you know, I think she would have liked that. And I'm so grateful that that happened. My dad was my strength during that. And, uh, and I had treated him so badly. You know, I'm the kind of daughter that I, I don't call you for months. You don't know where I am because I'm a bad drunk. And I'm, I divorced that man. I came back and divorced him because it was probably his fault anyway. You know, I always just, I wasn't really a great gal, you know. And and so what I did was um, I went into reckless abandon. I don't know if there's a line we cross or not, but I certainly changed then. And I uh, just went crazy. I drank. I used drugs. I started to use drugs. Drugs are only a part of my story. I'm not an alcoholic and anything. I'm just a drunk who used drugs to get there quicker. And um, I started to get very, very ill from what I was doing. Um, I, uh, I was just, I drank a lot of booze and, uh, and uh, pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. I think uh, women understand that a lot, as, as do men, and uh, the things that we do and the compromising we go through. And, and I just did everything and anything and just went crazy and uh, didn't care anymore. And then I met this one, another him, and I got pregnant, and he didn't want to be. And uh, so uh, we tried to make it work, and it just didn't work. And I drank and used drugs through my pregnancy, and that's not something I'm very proud of, but that's the kind of alcoholic I am. You know, I talked to my sponsor. My sponsor today is Peggy Mim and Peggy Martin, and she's a wonderful lady. And I've had years, it's been years for me to get through this part of my story because it's just a, 
You know, I've heard alco- women that I know were alcoholics that they stopped drinking during their pregnancy, and I never did. And I, and I, I've always felt so horribly guilty about that. And she said, Sheila, you know, the book talks about that there's a, a point you get where you don't, you lose the choice to drink. Unfortunately, you were pregnant. You didn't have a choice, honey. She said, you're, you're just, you're a sick person trying to get well. You know, we're not bad people trying to get good. And I heard that this weekend too. And, and so I, uh, I had this baby boy and, uh, and he was all right. You know, he was all right. And, uh, and I was so grateful because I used to always pray, you know, God, please take care of this baby. And that's all I'd ever pray. And, uh, and he, uh, I remember seeing him and thinking he was the most beautiful baby I'd ever seen. And I was going to love him. I was going to be a good mom. And, and I wasn't going to be like, a, well, I wasn't going to let him live a life that I had lived. And I was going to change. And that were, I did that for about two whole weeks, you know. And that's about as good as I could do. And and uh, I started drinking again and using. I met a Marine. <laughs> oh, God. And uh, <laughs> and I thought, you know, they take care of the whole country. I'm sure you could take care of me. And uh, <laughs> You know, the few and the brave and the proud. And the, and there's a couple of Marines that are in my home group, and they just love that part of my story. They just think that's great, you know. And so I went off to Oceanside and with this Marine and uh, all the. It's kind of like family down there. It's, you know, it's uh, it's like a kind of like pre-AA. You know, you're getting ready to get here, and there's this crazy. And and I remember him yelling at me one night. I knew you should. I knew I shouldn't have got you a bottle. And I thought, God, this sounds like days of wine and rose wine and here, you know. And I didn't like that. It felt weird. And somebody, he was, he was trying to, and he drank a little bit and uh, pretty good. And and his buddies would even say, don't drink, you know. And they, when you know, when big giant Marines start telling you not to have a drink, you know, you know, there might be a little problem there. And so, um, he uh, he left me. He went, found a, a wave or a whack or something, and got engaged. And so. Um, we, uh, I was, uh, ended up living on the floor in San Diego with a, a, a girl that was, a, I was a manicurist at this time as well, and she was a hairdresser, and she let me live there and live on her floor, and, and that's where we went, that's where I go, and, uh, and I, uh, started to drink even worse, and I would work at night, I would cocktail waitress at night and do nails during the day and try to take care of this kid, and, and he was a, he was a great little baby, he was just the best baby, and, uh, and I would come in so late that I would sneak in and pretend I was sleeping, and I'd get in, and, and the house would start stirring around 6.30, 7 o'clock, and I'd get in right before that and pretend I'd been in bed all night. And this girl that I lived with caught me one night coming in, and she said, if it weren't for that baby, you wouldn't be living here. There's something really wrong with you, and you need to get some help. And she said, you need to call. Call your dad. Can't you call your dad? And I said, I said, you know, you don't understand. I, I don't really call him. Uh, you know, I was afraid he'd probably hit me with a big book or something, you know. And uh, <laughs> and she said, I think you need to call somebody. She said, you, you know, have you looked at yourself lately? And she said, one of your eyes is dilated and the other one's not dilated. And she goes, well, what are all those sores on you? You know, and I didn't really have seen that part of me. And I had, I don't know if they were hives or what they were, but they were, I was sick. And uh, she said, you need some help. And so I called and his wife answered Vinoy. And she, see, we were talking about Al-Anon and belts. And she's a black belt Al-Anon. And, you know, and I was really glad that she answered the phone because uh, I was so afraid of my father. And and she said, honey, your dad's doing a fist step in the back room. And I said, well, I just wanted to let you know that I'm going to put Brad in a foster home and I'm going to walk the streets. That's the decision I'd come to. And, and she said, wait, wait, wait a minute. And I said, I just can't go on this way anymore. But I really never told him what I was doing. And and so she said, she said, well, well, we'll call you right back. And they called me back, and I did what any good alcoholic I think would do. I went and got drunk. It was like God, I almost confessed something. And and so I, I it was terrible. And and my father, circumstances, he, we got on the phone and talked, and he sent me a one-way ticket to Oklahoma. And he didn't he didn't send me money, and he didn't go to t- t- put me in treatment, and he didn't try to pay off any bill. You know, he sent me a one-way, non-cashable, I already tried, uh, ticket <laughs> to to Oklahoma. And he said, maybe maybe you could come here and maybe something else. And he really didn't want to, you know, and he talked to his sponsor one more time. You know, and his sponsor said, Jim, you know, maybe this is maybe this is your turn to give back. And his wife said the same thing. She said, maybe it's time for us to give her what we've been given. Maybe maybe something good will come of this. And he was real afraid for me to come there. He's afraid I'd come and he'd get involved with that baby boy of mine and... and um, and he really didn't know, and um, he would get involved with him, and, and I'd take off and leave him. They'd have to raise the child, or, or he'd get involved with him, and I'd take off with the child, and then he'd be depressed. And, you know, he didn't know what to think, and uh, he knew me, though, and he knew how I was. And, and so we, uh, 
We arrived in Oklahoma, and I remember feeling like such a failure in my life. And I had two boxes with twine around it and a, and a uh, stroller and my son. And that's all I had for 28 years of living. You know, and that was uh, 12 years ago this week. And that's where, yeah. And uh, in that house, you have to go to something. <laughs> so I went to Al-Anon. I loved Al-Anon. I really identified. I mean, I have. I've stood out there and wondered where he was. And then after a while, I think, what am I doing? I'm going to go have a drink and go to bed, you know. Uh, you know, you can always get another him. And, and I would share things like this in the Al-Anon meeting. And they would look at me very strangely, you know. And I think, you know, honey, have a, have a drink and a quaalude and go to bed. It'll be fine. And, and quit worrying about him. And, you know, and people just, you know, they, and I just really respect uh, the members of Al-Anon. They did that stuff sober. I don't even think so. I don't know how. No way. I mean, I would, the drunks, we don't put up with each other long, you know, without, you know, we have to have something to anesthetize or something. And um, so I, I, ha- I got a sponsor now and I'm trying to look good. In my parents' house, there were like butterflies and uh, the big books were in every room. There were drunks running in and out of the house, you know, calling, al It was just Grand Central 12-step AA, you know, it was just crazy and and I remember I'd go in the bathroom and just go in there and be alone in this bathroom because there was only like one butterfly in there and, and it would be all right, you know, and, uh, and, and I could just, you know, pull my head together because I'm not drinking and I'm crazy at this point. And so uh, my Al-Anon sponsor after a Saturday night open AA meeting, which I was directed to go to, said, you know, we're Al-Anons, we can go have a drink tonight. I said, you bet we can, darling. And i tell you what, I, I, um, I got drunk, of course, and she would go and get a drink, and I would order two and drink them down before she could get back, or she'd go to the bathroom or something, and I was drinking, drinking, and I was just guzzling drinking. And she thought I was having, like, I only had two. And I went into a blackout and um, tore down a bathroom door at a Taco Mile we were at, uh, she told me, I don't remember this, so when it, you know, I mean, she, she, she got scared. She thought, my God, I've got a wild woman here, another, you know, another drunk, uh, you know, and uh, she's still chasing drunks. And uh, so I, she had to go to confess to her sponsor, which she had done, and her sponsor happened to be my stepmother and my father's wife. I was so mad, you know. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know the snitches in AA? Boy, they were all around me, let me tell you what. I couldn't go anywhere without somebody telling somebody what I did. And I really hated that because I was from the streets, and, you know, you don't tell on each other, for God's sake. And I couldn't believe this, you know. And and so my dad uh, told me to come down to the pawn shop, and he owned a pawn shop, and he said, I want to see you down there. I knew I was in trouble. I knew, And I thought, he's going to scream and yell like we always do, and we fight, and it's just going to be awful. And, and he did no screaming, he did no yelling, and he looked at me, and he had tears in his eyes, and he said, you know, Sheila, you're an alcoholic. I think you're just like me, and I'm sorry for the life that you had, but I can't stand by and watch you do to your son what I did to you. And he he didn't yell. And... um. And I said, I understand. And I left there, and uh, I didn't go straight to an AA meeting, but I went and got drunk, and I, uh, it was horrible. And uh, I went and got drunk, and I had, but I wanted to be sober, but I just couldn't do it, you know. And, and I just did the only solution I knew, and I went and got drunk, and I wasn't going to drink, and then I drank. And, and uh, we had a party at our house. I was living with some other girls. I'd moved out of my parents' house by now, and, and these girls, and it was just crazy. It was just nuts, and uh, um I went into a blackout, and I woke up the next morning, or came to, and my son, I couldn't find my son, and it was December the 15th, 1984, and um, it was real, real cold out, and um, I couldn't remember where he was, I thought I'd put him in bed, but he wasn't in there, and I went and looked through the apartment, and I couldn't find him, I thought, my God, he's gone outside and froze to death, and it was like 20 some odd degrees outside, and, and I ran around, and uh, I was screaming and crying and asking God, please help me, please help me. And, and uh, my roommate came out of the room. She goes, what is wrong with you? What were you doing last night? And you're just crazy. And I said, I can't find Bradford. I can't find Bradford. And she said, he's right here. And, and he had been snuggled under her comforter. And when I opened the door to peek in, he, well, I couldn't see him. Oh, it's just a wreck. And, and he came. I can see it today. And I never, ever, ever, ever want to forget this feeling and, and, that, and that side of that baby. He was... Um, 20 months old and he was walking he had those little yellow jammies with feet in and he walked out and he, and he put his arms up and he said mom and I had a moment of clarity at that moment because I realized it was not my mother's fault it wasn't my father's fault this was my fault I was doing this to me this had nothing to do with anyone else I had done this to myself and I was doing it to my own child and uh, I said God please help me and I said mama's going to get help and I met a girl in AA who I just really liked and she was really neat and I called her 
And she wasn't home, but her husband was. And he said, are you drunk? And I said, no, I'm hungover. And he said, I know a little bit more about you than I probably should, Sheila. I think you need to come over here. And that man invited me to their home, and I sat down, and we waited for his wife, and he had a big book and a cup of coffee, and he 12-stepped me. He said, Sheila, you don't ever have to drink again if you don't want to. You don't ever have to live this way again if you don't want to. And he said, and it can be all right. And it was like magic. I'd never heard that before. If I had, I don't ever remember it. It was like someone turned on the lights for me. And I started my journey in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I am so grateful to those two people. Um, she has 26 days. She she drank again. They were an active couple in Alcoholics Anonymous. I know what it, I know what it means. I've seen so many of my friends do this, and he and they divorced, and he's never been back to Alcoholics Anonymous since. And she has 26 days, and she's very very sick. She's got hepatitis. And uh, but they were my Ebbies. You know, they got me here one more time. And uh, and I started going to meetings, and I hated going to meetings. And he said to me, you need to be at a meeting tonight. Tonight. It was Saturday night. And I said, I don't want to be at a meeting. And he said, you, have to, you should. And I said, I'm not going to y'all's group. I don't want to go to dad's group. That's his group, and I need my own freedom and to be me and, you know, the whole gay. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I love what Bob D says, you know, alcoholics lose everything and the first thing they get back is their opinion, you know. <laughs> I mean, I'm just dying inside and, uh, you know, I get a little little moment of, of, of relief and I'm ready to make my own decisions again. It's just sick. And he said, Sheila, that's a structured group and it's a strong group and you need Alcoholics Anonymous and you need it bad. And he said, I'd be at that meeting tonight at 8 o'clock if I were you. And eventually I did. I went to Al- I went to that meeting that night, and and it was um, and my dad was at that meeting, and um, he was very surprised to see me, and because um, we hadn't really talked, and uh, and it came time for the newcomers to raise their hand, you know, and they said, "Is anybody in their first 30 days of sobriety? Please raise your hand." Of course, I was sitting in the back. Where else do we sit? And uh, and in my tightest jeans, so that I, I don't even know how I ever got those on, and uh, thought I looked great though, and. And and, that, and I wasn't going to raise my hand, and that, that guy, the 12 sent me and his wife, they were both, you know, they were looking at you, you know, during that time. You know, you just feel it. So I look over, and they're going, and so I kind of scratched my head and did this, you know. And and, my, and there was 30 minutes of participation, and then a coffee break and a main speaker. That was the format of this meeting. My dad was there, and uh, he got called on. And uh, he said, of uh, of all the... He said, I saw my daughter raise, my, raise her hand, and of all the Christmas presents in the world, that one's the very best, and I, my heart kind of started to melt, and I thought, maybe my dad does love me, just a little bit, and, uh, and so we, uh, we had a really neat Christmas, and in spite of me being 10 days sober at Christmas, I mean, they kind of ignored me, not really, but I mean, it's like, you know, when I would whirl or do something, they were okay with it, I mean, I'm 10 days sober, and they, you know, my dad said, I bought my son a, um, one of those little shopping carts, you know. And my dad really a, was really a conservative guy. I mean, anybody that knows him. And uh, and uh, he said, if you take it back, I'll buy him a, br- a red wagon. I go, what? And he goes, that is a sh- girl's shopping cart. I go, it's not, Dad. I go, it's just a shopping cart. And they put their little toys in it. It's no big deal. You know, we had this fight for years, okay. <laughs> and he goes, if you take it back, I'll buy him a red wagon. And so I went to my sponsor, because I had a sponsor. And she said to me, why don't you let him do that? Why don't you cease fighting? And I thought, oh, this is going to be hard. (laughs) This is going to be simple, but not easy. Your price had to be paid. So I took that damn thing back, and he bought him the red wagon. And, um, And it was really neat. It was just, you know, I look back on it today. It's 11 years later. And, uh, gosh, I'm so glad I did the things she asked me to do. My sponsor used to, my roommates all moved out, and I had to go uh, live back with my parents. And my sponsor made me uh, bring my, she said, I want you to do something once a day nice for your dad, because we, we just didn't have any relationship. And I liked his wife, but I didn't like him. And she said, um, I want you to do something nice every day, and I always bring him his paper. I'd bring his paper in and uh, start his hot water for tea. And I did that every morning. And. We both love sports. He gave me my love of sports, and uh, we could talk about the sports page, and that'd be it, you know. And we started from there, and we uh, it grew and grew and grew. And my uh, 
on on, uh, February 25th of this year, uh, I got a call from Oklahoma, and my father was diagnosed with cancer, with lung cancer. He was at an emergency room with with alcoholics none of us all around him. And um, he died three months later, and it's been real hard for me. Um, He was not only my dad, but he was my old-timer in AA. And um, if I could be half the AA member he was, I would have really have done something in my life. Um, the last three places I've spoken have been three different states, and uh, every state I've been in, there was a guy he sponsored. And uh, there's a guy here today, his name's Ross, and uh, Ross really took good care of my dad. Because uh, I lived in Oklahoma, and I would come visit, and Ross would just run to the airport and never think a thing about it. And he and his son would come and wash my dad's cars every Saturday, and would just touch me. You know, and you all just took good care of my daddy, and uh, and you gave us a life that I only dreamt of. We had a relationship of father and daughter that I always wanted, and I owe everything to Alcoholics Anonymous, and uh, I hope I never get too busy with my outside stuff, you know, and it was so good to see Ross, you know, when I saw him, and his girlfriend's here, and uh, and it's just so neat, you know, because um, he just loved him, he'd carry him, and help him, and be at the hospital, and he stayed all night, and you know, and a lot of people, you all did stuff that I couldn't do, and I had a lot of flights out there, but I remember getting on that first plane the first time he was, at, first after he got diagnosed, and the first time I came out to Palm Desert, uh, out in Cathedral City, and I remember I got there, and I was on that plane, and I thought, thank God for the eighth and ninth step. Thank God I made my amends to my dad. You know, I made direct amends to him. I didn't just say, oh, well, he knows I'm sober. You know, the book doesn't say that, you know. I sat down with my dad and I made amends. I was sorry for being the daughter that I'd been. I was wrong to have had a baby out of wedlock, and I know that just killed him. You know, and I said, I'm so sorry that I did that to you. I'm sorry that there were times that you didn't even know where I was, and I caused you harm and worry, and I stole your right to be happy. You know, I'm sorry for the ugly things I've said to you all over these these years. I'm sorry I blamed you for mom. You know, and I, I told him I was wrong and, and that I, and, and I asked him to forgive me. And it was his 20th AA birthday is the day that I made amends and it just turned out to be that way because I'd asked him earlier that week, could I talk to you? I'm on my, my ninth step and on that Saturday I happened to be at the house and it was his AA birthday and he was going to celebrate his cake that night and he said, Sheila, back room. And I went, oh, he remembered and I was so worried. <laughs> And we made a, it was a beautiful thing. And he said, I don't know if you remember, but when you're about 11 years old, I try to make amends to you. And one of my big things was I felt like he had never made amends to me. You know, I'm such a self-centered alcoholic. I'm selfish and self-centered. That's the root of my problems. The big book tells me that. And he said, I tried to make amends to you. I was sorry that I abandoned you back in Oklahoma. And I was sorry I did this. And I was, do you remember that? And I did remember that. And it was so beautiful. You know, and I said, I, I, I do remember that. I, he didn't just come out and say, well, I'm doing my ninth step, you know. I mean, he did make amends, and I was always looking at something negative. I never looked at the glass that was half empty, you know, I mean, half full. I always thought it was half empty, and everything was half empty, and today I look at things that they're half full. Um, my, um, we made amends, and um, my dad, um, that night at the meeting, he came up and said, would you give me my 20-year cake? You know, and I never had given my dad a cake before. And um, it was such a neat time. And last year, um, you know, the last year of his life before he got diagnosed, we had the most wonderful things happen. Um, and this is how God works. God, God is perfect. And God knows exactly what he's doing, whether I think so or not. And if I will allow God's will to prevail in my life, I'll be okay. If I put AA in God in the center of my life, everything's always turned out all right. My life hasn't been perfect. I did get married, and I had another child. I had twins. I had a boy and a girl. And in my seventh month of pregnancy, that little baby girl died. You know, life isn't perfect in AA. You walk through those things. You know, you just walk through them. But Alcoholics Anonymous is at my house. You know, my husband's not a member of this program. I don't know if he needs Alan on yet. I haven't drove him that crazy, but I'm trying. (laughs) You know, and um, and they came to our house because they didn't want me to be by myself. And I had to carry that other baby until the end of the pregnancy. And, And Daniel was born a month early, and he's a beautiful baby boy. And he was just beautiful, and he did well, and he was... He was a little premature, but, you know, we worked through all that, and my dad was so sad, and he was so happy at the same time, and he came and saw him, and, you know, and they, it, it, my, that baby's name is little Jim Shaw. I mean, he's just like my dad. It's pretty scary to raise him, huh? You know, and he's just like him. He, he gets mad. And he's big, and and my dad was a fit thrower, you know, and that's just all he was. He'd just throw a fit, blow up, and ten minutes later, he won't buy you a Coke. 
you know, and wonder, you know, it's like, well, gee, what's wrong with you all, you know, and, and that's just how he was, and when I learned to accept my dad exactly the way he was, he became pretty, it was, you know, I can look at him, I could look at him, and he'd be doing, throwing a fit, and everybody going, oh, God, look at Jim, and I'd think, isn't he cute, you know, he's just over there throwing a fit, face all red, you know, we were at the International together, you know, and, and what a neat thing that was, and, and I got to come in early, and I came in for his 29th AA birthday at the Pacific Group, and I watched his sponsor give him his cake. And that would be the last cake he'd take. He died a month and two days before his 30th birthday. And God's, God is just perfect. You know, it's just perfect. And, uh, and uh, we went to the International and we held hands and cried during the flag ceremony. And, and I'd never been to an International. My dad was so excited I was there with him. And, and my son was there. My oldest son, Brad, was there. And, and um, Mom was there. Oh, God, it was so beautiful. And, uh, and we had the best time. And uh, he was, uh, the buses there, I don't know if you all were there, but God, there was trouble with those buses. You remember that? My God. Well, my dad was the one screaming at buses, you know. He was running up, and he, and he just had a big booming voice, you know, and he was screaming and pointing at buses, and they were way across the thing. And, you know, he didn't feel good, and his knee hurt, and his wife, and my stepmother just had did an operation on her knee, and it was just crazy. And I said, Dad, and he goes, what? And I go, there's a newcomer from Montana that's watching you. And he goes, okay, all right, you know, and he'd straighten up, you know. And, uh, you know, and we, and, and it was okay, you know. I could let him throw this fits, and he'd buy us a Coke later. It'd be all right, you know. <laughs> and, and and thank God. I mean, that's Alcoholics Anonymous. That's the psychic personality change it talks about in the spiritual experience. And if you read the spiritual experience in the back, the word change is in there five times. I had to change everything and everything, everything I was and everything about me. I am not the same woman. You know, I didn't own a dress when I got sober. And I've been taught in Alcoholics Anonymous so I'm behind this podium that I should dress in a dress or a skirt and look like a lady. You know, give back to what's been given to me. You know, I'm going to give you my best. I'm going to show respect for this program. This is a wonderful program. I love this program. And the things I have to shoot, I go to committed meetings. I'm a com- I go to committed meetings. I have meetings. There were old timers that I knew would be at my meetings. They had commitments. They didn't just go when they felt like it. They were there, and I would be so glad that they were there because they'd say something, and I know I could stay sober one more day. You know, and they didn't know that, but I'm a, I knew that in my heart, and I would look for them. Those crotchety old timers, I love them, you know, and they, they kept me, they helped me so much. And so it's important that I be where I'm supposed to be. My sponsors say things like, be where you're going to be. If you say you're going to do something, do it. If you're going to be here, be there. You know, keep a commitment. I mean, this was new for me, you know. I, I just kind of, well, maybe I'll go, maybe I won't. I don't know, whatever, for sure. I don't know. I, uh, you know, and I thought my sponsor doesn't matter today. My first sponsor stopped going to meetings at six years and 11 months sober. You know, she stopped going to meetings and she found another spiritual way. And uh, that's good for her. And I know I'm a drunk and I can't go without Alcoholics Anonymous. And, and I and I cannot stay sober today on yesterday's recovery. It's a daily deal. And, and you talked about that last night, Chuck. And I just said, you know, this is the thing that has just absolutely saved my life. Um, I buried my father. Uh, I was with my dad the day he died. And... Uh, he had guys that he sponsored were around that had flown in along with Ross, and uh, they we had had like a vigil at the hospice unit, and uh, they said, you know, I've never seen anybody that had so many visitors, you know, and uh, and I thought it was neat, and I was holding his hand, you know, and I walked in the room, and he had just gotten really bad through the night, and I didn't know he was that bad yet, and I walked in, and he died like five minutes later, and I held his hand, and I kissed him, and I told him he was the best dad. You know, because he used to always say, I wasn't a very good dad, but I'm a pretty good grandpa, you know. And, but that wasn't true in the last years. I thought he was a wonderful dad. Unfortunately, my brother hadn't seen my father in two years. He got a resentment. My brother had been sober at one time in Alcoholics Anonymous, and he hasn't been sober in years. And uh, he got a resentment, and uh, he walked off from my father and didn't speak to him for two years until he was diagnosed with cancer. My brother did the best he could. He came and saw him, and he said, I love you. But he couldn't come at the end, you know, and... So there were guys like Ross and there were guys like Calvin and Dave that fell, filled in my gap one more time. Because my brother just couldn't be there. And, you know, he'll have to walk through that himself. And I feel so bad for him. I wish he could have this life. It's such a wonderful way to live. It's such a freedom and a new happiness. It really is. And um, I am so grateful that you have given me. My kids are great. I have a 5-year-old and a 13-year-old. The 13-year-old's a little squirrely, but he's 13. You know, he'll act funny in a zip. He'll pop out. And then I think, well, it's hormones, you know. <laughs> and he just, he'll go goofy for about three days, and then a zip will pop out, and he gets better, you know, and I love it. I, 
And we laugh about it, you know, and make jokes. And he misses his grandpa. That was the first dad he'd ever really known. My dad was so good to Bradford and Daniel, and, and uh, he really does miss it. It was the first daddy he'd ever had. And uh, my husband adopted my son. I have a wonderful husband who supports me in everything I do. I'm so glad that he doesn't say, he, please don't don't go to a meeting. Don't do that. He never would never do that. He, he really respects Alcoholics Anonymous. His brother is... Um, six years sober in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous and we've been together nine years and I gave Richard a big book for Christmas one year and it was kind of a risk but I did it and uh, got sober about nine months later and you know you all have given me so much I uh, could never repay ever um, this is the most wonderful program and the steps work if you work them and uh, I do what my sponsor says I, I mind my sponsor I was a terrible member of AA the first six months of sobriety and my father started a conference before I even got sober called Canyon Conference and I went to this conference when I was, wasn't quite six months sober, and I was angry and irritable and restless and discontented, and I was just about on the edge, you know, and I'd been arrested sober and, oh, just all kinds of, nothing went right, ever. And it was really a tough time, and I uh, went to this thing called the Canyon Conference, and uh, it was the most wonderful thing, and I heard a lady named Sue D. and Wilma W. there, and, and I thought, if they can get this deal, I can too. And Sue's a member of al but I really identified with her story, and Wilma was talking about all this. She did all this crazy stuff like I did, and she stood up there and looked like the absolutely the most beautiful woman I had ever seen. And I thought, maybe this thing can work for me. Maybe I can have this thing, as it says in the big book. I must, I wanted it so bad. And I left that, that conference wanting Alcoholics Anonymous more than I wanted my anything my whole life. And that's what I believe it had to have, I had to have another surrender when I got here. I surrendered to alcohol before when I got here, and I surrendered to my ism, the disease of alcoholism, when I got here. And, and I knew I was going to have to do a lot of things, and I got busy in Alcoholics Anonymous, and you all taught me that. My father died two weeks before the Canyon Conference this year, and that was the first year I would be chair of the Canyon Conference. You know, but I know he was there. You know, I know he was there. And... Um, but you just go on and you suit up and you show up and you do whatever you got to do and you just do it. And everybody in AA just will gather around you. And when I don't have any strength, you know, I sponsor a lot of girls, a bunch of girls, love them to death. They're just crazy as hell. You know, my husband just loves them. We had a pit. We, he got a new vehicle and I said, are you going to trade the truck in? It was an old truck. You know, are you going to trade the truck in? And he said, no, I better keep it. I'll keep it out of dad's and you know, you know how your girls move. <laughs> You know, he loves the A. You know, he loves he loves what he, you know, and he's always helping one of the girls. You know, they'll come. And I remember one of the girls, she got a new car. You know, and her husband was mad at her because she didn't get the right one or something. So she brought it over, and Dave got all excited and got in it. You know, and kicked the tires and did all the things men do when they get to see a new car. And she was so happy. You know, she was just so happy that he had done that. And and he, you know, the whole somebody gets a new car and they have to bring it over show Dave. You know, and they're, he's kind of like big brother. And um. I have a life that I always dreamt of today, absolutely always dreamt of, and um, it's nothing I did, I did stay sober, but you all have done it. Alcoholics Anonymous has been absolutely a miracle in my life, and um, I can't imagine um, what my life would be like without you all and without this program, and I owe my very life to AA, and uh, my, I had no life before I got here, and I want to be sure to take care of the things I need to take care of. As far as Alcoholics Anonymous, it is the center of my life. Absolutely. I love Alcoholics Anonymous, and I am so very grateful to have been here today. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.